Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Flipgrid live event. I'm Anne from Team Flipgrid, and today we're celebrating Earth Day with California State Parks. Before we get to the presentation, let me just say, if you're not familiar with Flipgrid, we're a free video discussion platform from Microsoft. And we're on a mission to empower every person on the planet to share their voice and respect the diverse voices of others. That's why we're so excited to partner with California State Parks to celebrate Earth Day and help them share their collective voice with the world. Today, we're gonna to be joined by some incredible interpreters. My friend Steve Yahelka and Parker Grand are both here, and they're gonna be taking us from the California Redwoods all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. And they're gonna be teaching us and helping us understand how we can help restore the earth. So Steve, are you ready? It's time for you to jump in, take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much for that introduction, Anne. Uh, yes, I am Steve with California State Parks and today coming to you live from Hindywood State Park, which is a beautiful place where we get to explore our coast redwoods. Now, we are going to be learning quite a bit today and uh, we're going to be talking about, we're going to take you all the way from the redwoods all the way to the ocean with Parker. And um, you're out, we want to know where people are coming from. So uh, tap that into the Q&A box and let us know where you're coming from. But we're going to you know, first learn about how these amazing redwoods actually store carbon and help us uh, fight off the effects of climate change. And they also, uh, we're going to also give you a chance to ask some questions directly to us. And of course, we're going to take a selfie event, uh, you know, later on in the program. So be ready. I hope everybody's very excited. Um, now, let's see. Do we have any locations coming up? Mm. Well, not seeing any at the moment, but let's see. Let's just go ahead and dive in. <laughs> Oh, well, actually, I see them. There we go. We have uh, Ms. Cove's class in Alberta, Canada. We have uh, uh, you know, Seattle, and Wa uh, Seattle, Washington, Poland. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Turlock, California, and uh, La Jolla Elementary. We have uh, Pennsylvania, Manteca, California, Georgia. People joining from all over, and this is amazing. So we're very happy for you to have joined us today. Now, um, let's just get in and figure out what, how amazing these amazing trees are, the Coast Redwoods. Now, these amazing trees are a state symbol for California because these trees have a lot of history with us as Californians. And um, well, maybe you've never been to the Redwoods. Well, these trees are truly something to admire. Trees like this provide us with so much inspiration and, and you need to stand in awe at the base of these towering giants. Now the tree that I'm standing in front of, Coast Redwood, Sequoia Sempervirens, as the botanist has say. Now these trees are just massive. Well, if you take a look at this tree, if I measure it from one side all the way to the other side, of the tree, we find that this tree is about 18 foot wide. Now, that's not all because these trees are the tallest living organisms in the world. Let's just take a look at how tall is tall. Now, as we scale up the trunk of this tree, well, you, you'd be hard stretched to see some of the very first branches until there they are, already about 100 feet up the tree. Now, these amazing trees grow to heights of over 350 feet tall. And when we uh, get to the top of our view, we start to lose the canopy because these trees actually can reach into the clouds. Coast redwoods exist along the coast of California from the southern border of Oregon all the way south past Monterey into areas of Big Sur. 
And these trees, these areas there, the trees grow, the range of the redwoods, actually give the trees the perfect conditions for them to grow. Coast redwoods, well, they are the keepers of their own ecosystem. And by them grabbing fog out of the sky with their upper canopy needles actually make rain for all the organisms below. Now, not only this, well, <laughs> all, the tr all the plants that we see down here actually have to be adapted to the amount of shade. So they may have bigger leaves and are able to photosynthesize in the understory, which we call everything that grows below the canopy. Now, being keepers of their own ecosystem, they actually provide us with a lot of great natural services. These trees draw more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and hold it onto it for longer than any other tree in the world. And this is all a service that all plants play because of photosynthesis where the upper or the leaves of a plant like this actually absorb sunlight through their chloroplast within their leaves and using that sunlight they take water and carbon dioxide and make food for themselves called glucose and not only that do they well, they use that glucose send it throughout the body of the tree, then use that carbon dioxide and water, H2O, as the simple building blocks to allow them to grow. Now, as a tree may start off as just a little tiny seed, something only about the size of a chili flake. Well, these, these trees may grow from a seed only that big, if you can believe that. Now, this little seed, if it finds the perfect spot in the soil and gets enough water and enough sunlight, will grow a whole one to two feet in its very first year. Now, as it draws water and carbon dioxide and builds itself using those two basic ingredients, it will grow taller and taller, but also stack a new ring of wood on every year, growing bigger and bigger. Now, why is this important? Well, as you draw more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you help reduce the amount of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, which is amazing because we know greenhouse gases are causing climate change. Trapping heat in the heat trapping blanket that uh, covers all surfaces of our earth in our atmosphere. Now, one of these trees can actually pull 150 tons of atmospheric carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in its whole life. And there isn't just one tree. Well, there are about 38 trees per acre in a healthy old growth redwood forest. So we have to think of how we can actually stand with the redwoods and how we can start to start to uh, repair our earth and help to become more um, better stewards of our planet. We can restore our earth. Now, with that, I want to take you all the way down to uh, the ocean. Let's see. Are we ready to go to the ocean? Is Parker with us? I am. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Oh, it is so nice to meet with everyone today. My name is Parker, and I am coming to all of you today from the coast. Ah, the ocean. This here, the mighty Pacific Ocean, my absolute favorite ocean in California. Do you all like the ocean? Do you live near the ocean? 
maybe some of you do well maybe some of you don't as well but no matter where you live the ocean connects all of us it's one of my absolute favorite resources especially here at Gaviota State Park where I'm at we're located near Santa Barbara California but isn't this place pretty spectacular Ooh, I just love our oceans and well our oceans play a very important role in regulating our climate and our weather. They also help to store carbon similar to trees. But you know, most importantly, the ocean provides half of the air that we breathe. That means every other breath we take, that oxygen, well, it was supplied from the ocean. All right, are you ready to take some deep breaths with me? Okay, I hope so. Here we go, let's breathe in and breathe out. We'll breathe in and breathe out. Wow, we just took two deep breaths there. And one of those breaths, all of that air, all that oxygen came from our oceans. Isn't that pretty incredible? No matter where you live, that's why our oceans are one of our most important resources. Now, hey, would you maybe like to discover some of the creatures who live here in our ocean that it's our job to protect? Well, I hope so. All right. Well, I am going to start out with one of my favorite creatures that we see uh, quite frequently. I like to uh, cruise through. Wait, do you see something? No way. Fish. Mm hmm This here is one of our fish. More specifically, this is a halibut. And ooh, we have lots of halibut that live off of our shores. It's an important part of our economy. A lot of people like to go fishing here. Do any of you like to go fishing? What's your favorite place to go? Perhaps do you like to go fishing in the ocean? Mm, but we love our fish and it's important. It's our job to protect our fish and all of the creatures who live here. So everyone has even more food to eat. Ah, our fish, I love them as they swim on through. Mm. All right, well, I have another one that's pretty spectacular. Would you maybe like to see that as well? Here it is. Wow, have any of you seen these before? Well, these here are what we call the abalone. We absolutely love abalone. This here is a red abalone. I can tell from what color it is here. This here, in our area, we have another kind of abalone known as the black abalone. And unfortunately, those ones are endangered. There's not too many of them left, and that's because of, well, us people and the actions that we took here in the ocean. We took too many of these. Ah, oh, these pretty awesome. In case you've never seen an abalone before, I like to say these are like a snail and they graze at the bottom of the sea. So we have areas within our parks and even underwater areas that are designed to protect species just like this. Pretty awesome, huh? Well, I have one other thing that I would like to share with you, but then I have something else that we can do to help restore our earth to share. All right, and this is one of my favorite creatures. Ooh. Have any of you seen these before? Well, this here is the California mussel. Wait a second, do these look like your mussels? Ah, uh, well, these here, these are the muscles of the ocean. And like our muscles, they are really strong. And they have little hairs that they use to latch onto the rock out here. Imagine living there where all the waves pound on you all day long. Pretty harsh environment to live in. I mean, would you want to live in the ocean? Might be pretty cool, right? All the creatures that live there. Oh, there are so many mysterious creatures of the sea. But yeah, these muscles here, they 
filter their food. So they drink in a whole bunch of water, about 15 gallons of water a day. Do you drink 15 gallons of water every day? I know, I know, I drink like four water bottles. That would be like drinking 80 water bottles a day. But that's how they get their food. That's their adaptation. But unfortunately though, that sometimes can be a problem for them. Speaking of problems, well, our coastline and our oceans all throughout the world see a lot of something. Do you have any ideas on what we might see a lot of? Wow. We see a lot of pollution. Yeah, and trash and litter, especially plastic pollution. That is the number one debris that we see along our coastline all throughout the world and within our oceans. And we have to do our job to protect all of these creatures that live here. Because, well, you know, something as simple as a plastic straw or a, a water bottle, just like this. Well, this water bottle, it's one big piece right now. But what do you think? Is it always going to stay one big piece? Hmm. Well, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, this water bottle right here is going to break up into thousands of tiny small pieces. We call those microplastics. And well, that could be a problem for some of our creatures in our ocean, especially like, well, our fish, if they go swimming along, could they eat that tiny piece of plastic? Yeah, they could eat it. They could eat those tiny pieces of plastic. And even our mussels who like to drink all of that water. Whew. Well, we see a lot of plastic that ends up in there. But hey, what if I go to a place and collect the mussels to eat them? Or what if I go here and I go fishing? What else am I going to be eating? You got it, the plastic makes its way up our entire food chain. So it's something important for us to be aware of. And well, when I was walking here this morning, would you like to see what I found along our shore? Well, I found all of this here. I found a whole bunch of fishing line. And this was just all laying there. I know, is that supposed to be there? Do we just find fishing line normally in our ocean? Not really, but this is something that doesn't belong there. So it's important for us to recognize about how much debris enters our ocean every single year. It's pretty incredible. But something that you all can do to make a big difference is something called take three for the sea. All right, are you ready to say that with me? Okay, let's say it together. Take three for the C. All right, nice job, I hope you all said it. What that means is where, when you go for a walk, whether it's in your neighborhood or at your school or in your city or even at the beach, I like to tell people to take three pieces of trash just to pick it up as you're walking. And well, that's three less pieces of trash that will be on our land or in our ocean. That's an easy way that we can make a big difference. Imagine if all of us here today did that. Whew. I don't know, I, can't, I don't think I can count that high. That's a lot of math, but that's something easy that we all can do. So take three for the sea. But there are so many other things that we can do too. So I want you to be thinking about how we can really restore our earth because, well, the possibilities are endless. Now with that, I hope you enjoyed exploring a little bit about my state park here, Gaviota State Park near Santa Barbara, California. And I'm going to invite Ann back um, to ask some amazing questions to us, uh, both Steve and I, that you've been putting in the chat box. But um, before we get started with that, um, I was thinking it would be fun to take a selfie. Does that sound good to you all? Would you like to take a selfie? 
Oh, good. Well, make sure um, to tag us on social media at CA State Parks or at Flipgrid um, to, so we can see your awesome photos. All right, we'll give you a second to get ready. All right, are you ready? Okay, are you ready, Steve? Oh, all right, I see Steve. I sure am. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Well, yeah, look at that fish. <laughs> I know, pretty awesome, huh? All right. Well, Anne, are you still with us? I am, Stephen Parker. I just got my selfie, too. How fun to see from the redwoods to the ocean. And friends, we have so many folks literally tuning in from around the world. I want to give a shout out to Olga Lopez and her class down in Queretaro, Mexico. Hola a todos. And Mrs. Gardezzi's fifth graders at Longden Elementary School. The Bennett School is here. We have folks tuning in from the United Arab Emirates. Hello and welcome. Dr. Kirby's class, Mrs. Cope's class. Mamtika, California is here. La Jolla, California. Hello to our friends. So we have some really awesome questions. Steve, I want to start with you. These are questions not only about the Redwoods, but somebody asked, what does photosynthesis mean? So can you describe it to us again really, really quickly? Oh, well, so photosynthesis is actually a process that um, allows plants to get their food. And it's using everything that a plant has available to it. It's a really cool adaptation that uh, all plants have. Well, they have this ability to take in the sunlight through their leaves. Remember those green leaves? Well, green is the perfect color to allow them to absorb sunlight because it's right in the middle of the light spectrum. And using the energy that it can absorb, it will actually take water and carbon dioxide water from the ground that it gets through its roots and carbon dioxide from the air and it cooks its food together making a sugar now that sugar is used all throughout the plant to allow it to grow and build itself using just those basic ingredients of water and carbon dioxide so it's a it's kind of a complicated process but it's a great question and uh, i think you will learn more and more about photosynthesis as, uh, as you go on in life. <laughs> that is an awesome description, thank you. And one more quick question, because I'm gonna, I have a bunch for you and Parker both, but you have that awesome redwood right behind you. And we have so many folks who asked, how tall is the tallest redwood that we know of? Oh, so the tallest redwood that we know of is actually up in Humboldt um, at a park called Prairie Creek. It's a tree that we call Hyperion, and it now measures 380 feet tall. Um, you know, and in order to find out how tall those trees are, somebody had to climb them. I bet, you know, I, I, you know, while I love the redwoods, I like to look at them from the ground. Uh, <laughs> climbing up 380 feet, is, is just incredibly tall. That's uh, about the size of a 37-story building. Wow, that is an incredibly tall tree, 37 stories around there. That's extremely tall. That's so cool to think about. Somebody's job scientifically is even measuring that. Wow. Parker, we had so many questions for you. Folks are wondering, was that a real fish? <gasps> Oh, I know. Don't you love my fish? All right, well, it is my well-kept secret. This isn't a real fish, but doesn't it look real? I know. These halibut, they're kind of flat. They just live on the sand, and they kind of cruise. They camouflage in, but yeah, this isn't real. Well, it was a, definitely a fun prop to help us learn, but we do have great questions. Folks wondering about what other endangered fish or other species might you encounter there at Gaviota State Park? 
That's a great question. You know, there is another species of fish that we see um, known as the steelhead, and they live in both freshwater and saltwater. We have a creek just down the way um, from where I'm at, and that is a very critical habitat for these fish. There's a lot of scientists who come here to study them and to, to study their recovery efforts in this area. So that's one species that comes. They live in freshwater and they come out here in saltwater. We occasionally, sometimes the people who go fishing here will catch them, so we know they're here, but it's important that they release some as well so we get even more of them. Also, we see sea otters too sometimes. This is the southernmost place in California where you'll see a sea otter. And similar to our other fish, there's lots of scientists who are making sure that they extend even further south. That's awesome, Parker, thank you. We have one more question for you right now. You shared some of the pollution that's off, often found on the beach and we have students who are curious if it's safe to swim in the ocean if it's polluted. That's a great question. I know, you know, I wouldn't want to go swimming in a place that has a lot of pollution. And that's why we have to do our part to restore our earth because, you know, it wouldn't be really good and wouldn't be fun to go there. And the ocean wouldn't be really healthy either if there weren't a lot of animals there. Because if there's a lot of pollution, the animals won't want to live in that area. Um, they'll move on to another region. So those are all important things to remember, that then our ocean won't be happy and healthy if there's too much of it. Yeah, that's definitely a great reminder. Steve, I'm going to come back to you with a question. You're coming from the Redwoods talking about the process of photosynthesis, how trees grow, sources of oxygen, and these students are wondering why do people talk more about trees for oxygen than the ocean? Well, I, you know, it is very, uh, very that's a tough question, I tell you. Now, you know, the trees are kind of just really impressive, right? We, we talk about um, them creating oxygen. Um, it, because of their size, we, we, notice, uh, we notice them a lot more. Now, the ocean actually is a, is, a whole, is a habitat for lots of kelp and algae and things that we kind of think are all slimy and gooey. You know, so I think then they actually do produce more oxygen in their ability to photosynthesize. And, uh, you know, we just kind of might be turned off by the fact that they're slimy and gooey. Um, but they, they, you know, you think about how big our ocean is, or, you know, all the oceans in the world, you know, how big they are and how much algae and how much kelp is out there all doing photosynthesis, photosynthesis. So, so I think it's because of the, the sliminess of the algae. Honestly. I appreciate that answer, Steve. Going from the redwoods back to the coast, Parker, I want to ask you for your insight on this as well. Why do you think folks perhaps pay more attention to the trees rather than the ocean? What insights can you share? Yeah, just like Steve mentioned, there is so much kelp and algae that lives in our ocean that provides an important habitat um, for the creatures in the water. Steve's in um, the forest of the land, but the kelp forests are the forests of the ocean. I don't know if you can see behind me, but we do have a couple of large kelp beds that are out here. You might see some kind of some spotty areas. Well, those are kelp beds and the kelp can grow um, up to a foot a day. Wow, isn't that pretty incredible? And you remember how uh, long Steve said it would take for one of those redwood trees to grow about a foot? Yeah, pretty incredible. Um, there's also lots of bacteria and microorganisms, really small things that you can only see with a microscope that live in our ocean too, that happen to produce a lot of oxygen as well. That is awesome. I appreciate you both answering this question. We have a few more questions we're going to ask. And Steve, this one is for you. What types of animals live in the Redwood Forest? Oh, well, that is such a great question. You know, animals are really amazing to live in the, this forest. 
Um, you might find uh, white-tailed deer running in the uh, through the forest, but they're very hard to see because there's so many trees. Now, wherever you have deer, you also have the possibility of uh, some predators, things like mountain lions. And, uh, well, mountain lions have a big range, and they can live in a lot of different environments. Um, but, you know, things that specifically live in the redwood forest are important animals such as, like, the banana slugs. These giant slugs that are about, like, a foot long, they are important to the forest because they help process soil. They are types of decomposers. And when they eat dried leaves and, and, uh, and moss and different things on the ground, well, they digest it and release nutrients which help the trees grow. So animals not only benefit from the forest as a habitat, but they also can give back to that forest by helping the you know, ecosystem work. It's amazing. Now, up in the canopy, we have an endangered species that we call the Northern Spotted Owl. And unfortunately, it had lost so much of its habitat about 95% of ancient forests, like the Coast Redwood Forest, had been cut down in early logging of California. But thankfully, we have parks like Hendywood State Park and uh, you know all these areas that are now protected. And we monitor the health of our northern spotted owl, which is pretty cool uh, nocturnal, well, a predator that helps uh, Kind of keep balance to all the all, all the rodents, like mice and and rats and even skunks. So we we really uh, want those uh, those northern spotted owls to come make a comeback, and they're they're very cool to hear at night. Yeah, and to do their part to help, that's incredible. Now, Miss Bruns class is asking. How do you become a park ranger? So Parker, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about that journey. Yes, that is a great question. Well, you know, my um, adventure with uh, the California State Park um, started a long time ago back when I was in fourth grade, right? Do we have any fourth grade classes joining us today? All right, well, when I was your age, I started volunteering for California State Parks and well, eventually I started working for them when I graduated from high school, and then um, then it kind of evolved into a career. And so, um, and now I am the um, state park interpreter along our coastline, um, where I work at three parks. And in order to become um, what we do, um, you have to go to college, and you have to study something about either like history or nature, which are all really awesome things. And I. I know I studied natural resources, so that's my field of expertise. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that process. I know folks were super curious, and I was curious too, so thanks, Parker. Okay, this is the same question for the two of you, and then Steve, I've got, I've got one more for you, but Mr. Parker's fourth graders are asking, why should we take care of Earth? And that's such a great question as we're celebrating Earth Day and learning from you both today? That is a great question. You know, it is so important for us to protect our Earth, to um, really just to help all of our wildlife and our creatures that live there. I like to say when our land, our oceans are happy and healthy, then, well, the life for us people will also be happy and healthy because all of these different resources, like our ocean, help to regulate the climate and our weather. So if the ocean's not really healthy, well, that means, well, our weather's not gonna be so good anymore. And if it's not healthy, well, we might not have a lot of fish to eat if you like to eat fish or other resources that we get from the ocean. So um, those are some of the, just a few of the many reasons why um, we should wanna protect all of our land and water. Parker, thank you so much. I appreciate your insight. And Steve, both of you know we have tons of students joining in from around the world. And we're so excited that California State Parks 
has this super incredible Earth Day collection available inside the Flipgrid Discovery Library. And you both know this topic has been translated into 19 different languages. Students can use it to respond to. And Steve, I just wanted to ask if you have a little bit of insight about the video and the message that California State Parks is sharing in that topic. Well, that, that's great. Thank you, Anne. You know, the video that Jenny did out in Calaveras Big Trees was, uh, you know, a, a lot about the same things that we've learned today. And, you know, it really, it really hits on the point that as a community, we can work together to build, um, build solutions. So I'm going to use the Flipgrid community as my community, and I'm going to reach out to all you, the educators, to go and explore this video and others that are uh, provided from California State Parks, and I want to. We want to hear your uh, your solutions. How do we paint a brighter future for our planet? so that we can help the redwoods. We draw inspiration from these amazing trees. We can draw inspiration from the ocean. And as a team, Team Flipgrid, we can actually get, you know, get everybody involved. So start thinking about it. And all you educators out there, I want you to go out and check out some of these collections. And uh, we want to hear your responses. What an incredible idea. I love that. Knowing that we can all work together to create change and help restore the earth. Everybody can do their part to help. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Teachers, parents, friends, as you're listening in, please know this Earth Day collection is ready for you to use right now. You can access it by going to the link aka.ms slash Earth Day Collection. Go right inside your browser. I know my friends on the back end are going to drop it right in the chat and you can copy and paste that link. But you can use this topic right away. And as Steve said, have your students reflect and take away their learning from this event today. I want to thank Steve and Parker so much. They have shared insights. They have helped us learn. They have shared inspirational messages on how we can do our part to help. So Steve and Parker, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's been an absolute blast spending this time together today and folks who've turned in. I hope you join us for the next event. We're here every Wednesday live with these incredible events. And you can register to join us at aka.ms slash Flipgrid Live Events every Wednesday at the same time. Don't forget to check out that incredible Earth Day collection. It is live on the California State Parks Flipgrid Discovery Library page. And again, if anybody's listening in, friends, educators, parents, if you're looking to learn more about Flipgrid or take next steps in your learning community, feel free to sign up for a professional development event. My name is Anne, my colleagues, Jess, Jorne, Feli, we're all here to help. And you can find those resources at aka.ms slash Flipgrid PD. That's Flipgrid P as in pineapple, D as in dog. Friends, happy Earth Day to you all. We're so glad that you tuned in to celebrate with us. And remember, you're invited to do your part to help restore the earth. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining.